Let's pray. Father, we love you, and we thank you so much for your love for us. And Lord, we pray that everything we are and everything we do would honor you. You are our maker. You are our Lord. You are our guide. And you speak to our hearts. And so, Lord, I pray that now, through your word and by your Holy Spirit who is in this place, that you would speak to each of us right where we are. You are so good, and you are so faithful, and you are so true. And so, Lord, open our hearts to receive what you would have to give us today. Let us leave this experience different, having been transformed by the renewing of our minds to be more like Jesus. For it's in his precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. Well, I always enjoyed the first few days of school because the pressure was off, you know? I mean, you, you had to focus on your outfit. That was important. How many of you wore an outfit that was entirely too hot for August and a bus ride, uh, but you had a good fall outfit to get back to school and you were ready to show your friends? I have a daughter in my house now who has reached the age where she really, really cares about what she's going to wear. My son, less so, but he cares in a different kind of a way. He doesn't want to look like he tried, you know? And, uh, and so that's good. That's good. Whereas my daughter's a little different, and you all understand that. Um, but the first few days of school, the pressure's kind of off because you know you're just going to kind of go over the basics. You're going to get through the syllabi or the expectations of each class. You're going to kind of just go through. The, you're you're going you're gonna to be able to see that, yes, there will be tests, and there will be papers, and there will be projects that are due, but they're not due for a long time. Or at least it feels like that right now until the panic sets in, right? But you've got a couple of days just to kind of breathe, get your bearings, and kind of reorient yourself to the new school year. Well, I wanted us to take a moment to do the same thing, because over the course of the next several weeks here at First Baptist Church, we're going to talk about what it means that we have decided to follow Jesus. We have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. In fact, that's going to be our hymn of response today. We're going to sing that song. Uh, on the front of your bulletin, there's a logo that T.J. Renfro, our youth pastor, developed that you'll see appear again tonight uh, on some t-shirts that your staff will be wearing at our Back to School Bash. But we have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. So what does that mean in everyday life? Because faith is not a one decision decision. Faith is an every decision decision. That I have I have committed my life to trusting and following Jesus. And we're going to look back over the course of the next several weeks. What did that look like for his first followers? What did that look like for the disciples? What did that look like for the apostles? And, and, and what did that look like throughout the course of their life on earth? And how did that end for them? And how's it going for them now? You ever think about the disciples in that way? They're still trusting and following Jesus in the heavenly realm. So we're going to look at that, but today, I wanted to give us just the basics. Nothing too complicated today, just the basics of what a Christian is and what a Christian does. And in fact, I want to change that name just a little bit. I want to make it a little bit more descriptive and a little bit more distinct, because Christian has kind of been taken and used in a lot of different ways to mean a lot of different things over the course of the last two millennia. So what does it mean to be a Christ follower? Because, well, the definition is in the name. To be a Christ follower, to be a Christian is to be one who is like Christ. The, the followers of Jesus were first called Christians at the church at Antioch. That's a great name. But for clarity's sake, in 2023, I want to talk to you today about Christ followers, because that's what we're called to be. We're called to be those who have decided to follow Jesus, and we decide in every moment to follow Jesus instead of following the flesh or the world or the enemy. What does that look like? Well, I want to invite you to open your Bible. We're going to look at one verse today, John chapter 10, verse 27. John chapter 10, verse 27. And in this incredible chapter, from this incredible book, we're going to look at one verse in which Jesus kind of gives us the basics, gives us a bottom line understanding of what it means to be a Christian and what it means to be a Christ follower. 
And I haven't given you your theme yet. I'll give it to you in just a second. But I want to read to you this text. If you're in the Red Pew Bible in the room, this is page 897. We're at the top of page 897. Jesus is speaking, and this is what he says. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So this descriptor given by Jesus of his sheep, his people, his disciples, his church, is that we know his voice, we listen for his voice because we know his truth, and we know that he's never going to contradict anything he's communicated in his word. So as he leads us and guides us by his Holy Spirit, we understand that he's not going to lead us into sin because he's not going to contradict himself. But we seek to follow him according to his word and according to his spirit. We listen for him. We do life differently. We are pre-committed people. Our greatest allegiance is to Jesus, even over and above our husband or wife, even over and above our children, even over and above our calling, our profession, our occupation, even over and above everything that we are, our first allegiance is to Jesus. So we listen for his voice. Lord, lead me to be the husband that you've called me to be, to be the wife that you've called me to be. Lead me to be the father that you've called me to be, the mother that you've called me to be. Lead me to be the employer or the employee that you've called me to be in this moment of time. Lead me to invest in people according to your will for my life and your will for their lives. Lord, we're pre-committed. We trust and follow Jesus. The disciples, when Jesus called them, gave them a single universal call, and it was a two-word call. And he gave it to them multiple times. Peter got to hear it several times. John got to hear it several times. We'll get to hear it several times, too. Two words, follow me. Now, that implies that you trust him enough to follow him. And so here's the theme for the message today. And if you're taking notes, you can write this down. We have decided to trust and follow Jesus, no turning back. We have decided to trust and follow Jesus, no turning back. You say, why do you break it out like that? Well, because here's why. Our first call is to trust that Jesus is who he says he is, that he is the second person of the Holy Trinity, the Son of God. God incarnate in flesh to be among us, to reveal to us the Father, and to show us how we are to live, to teach us, and to lead us, and to be our guide. We have to trust that that is true, and we have to trust Him enough to say, Lord, you are asking me to die to myself and to surrender to your leadership in my life. You know, some people would say, well, do you really think God would want me to deny my urges and do something different from what I want to do? And my response is, absolutely. That's the whole message of Christianity. Deny yourself, die to yourself, and surrender to Jesus. So there are a lot of urges I have. How many of you have urges? Just because you have an urge doesn't mean it's right. You know what good teachers are going to be doing over the course of the next couple of weeks? They're going to be giving lists of rules and expectations in the classroom because sometimes little Johnny's going to have an urge to hit little Billy in the side of the head. And little Johnny can't hit little Billy in the side of the head. There's lawyers involved when that happens. So we have to teach that there are boundaries in which freedom exists. What does God do? He gives us boundaries in which freedom exists. How many of you are looking forward to going around the roundabout as the students return to Western? Huh? I want to encourage you. Find a different way for a couple of weeks. Because I'm going to tell you something. I about got T-boned the other day. And I was following the rules, but somebody had come from a different place where maybe they don't have as many roundabouts as we now have in Bowling Green. And listen, I love the roundabouts. They're very efficient. It's great. 
but they're not very efficient if somebody doesn't know that they're supposed to yield. <laughs> and so I would just encourage you, as the students come back, pray for them, but not around the roundabout on 31W, okay? Okay. Um, how many of you have urges sometimes that you have to say, Lord, I surrender this urge to you? Well, I mean, that's life. That's life. And so, yes, we trust Jesus enough to say, I'm going to have desires that you say I shouldn't have, so I'm going to surrender those to you. And I'm not going to function in those desires. And I'm going to follow you. Wherever you lead, I'll go. Whatever you want, I'll do. My answer is yes, Lord. And so I want to give you four ways that we kind of summarize this here at First Baptist Church, and these are really simple. Four ways that we trust and follow Jesus in every day that we live. The first one is this, and this is your first point. Christ followers worship God. Christ followers worship God. Remember when they asked Jesus what the most important commandment was? He said… He's quoting the Shema here of Deuteronomy chapter 6. The most important commandment is this. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. That your devotion has to be to God first. My devotion has to be to God first. That's the most important thing. You get that one right, everything else flows from it. You miss that one, and the Christian life doesn't make any sense at all. Everything stems from a proper love relationship that I have for my Father who art in heaven because He first loved me and sent His Son to redeem me. I love Him with every part of who I am, and that means that I live my life as an outpouring of praise and adoration to Him. That's worship. Worship isn't just the first 30 minutes of the church service. Worship is every moment that a Christ follower lives, that I am to, to sing songs in worship, praise to the Lord, the Almighty. I love that song. That I, might, that I might come and behold the wondrous mystery of my Lord who has been revealed to me because He loved me and wanted me to know Him so that I would join my voice in singing. But that's not all worship's supposed to be. No, we're supposed to love the Lord our God with all our heart and with all our mind and with all our soul and with all our strength. In other words, every part of who we are, we are to love the Lord first. And if we get that right, everything else will fall into order. Now, if we try to take God and make Him some addendum to our lives, everything else will be out of order. It's kind of like when you go through the school lunch line. How many of you remember going through the cafeteria line? Now, it's different now. I understand over at Bowling Green High School, they're going to have socializing steps or something where you can sit on the ground. It's going to be amazing, but it's sure different from what I grew up with, you know? I remember getting my tray. How many of you remember the tray? How many of you still have to keep your food from touching because you had a tray? Okay? Okay. You go through, and everything has its spot. You have an entree spot, you have a primary side spot, you have a secondary side spot, you have a dessert spot, and you have a milk spot because everybody knows milk comes in cartons. That's how you do it. And everything has its place. Well, I learned in my life for so long, my faith was kind of like the extra side spot, not the primary side spot the extra side spot. You know, it's important. I'll tack it in. I'll try to make church when I can. I'll try to, you know, listen to the preacher when I can. I'll try to turn it on to Christian radio when I can or, you know, whatever. But it was just kind of the extra side, take it or leave it. I'd like to go to heaven when I die. And I had this amazing revelation in my mind, this epiphany. No, faith is the tray. Faith is the tray. Kids, when you go through the lunch line, get your tray. This is your faith in Jesus Christ. Everything else goes within the context of that. Everything goes within the context of my faith. My faith isn't just an extra side. My faith is the foundation of it all. We're called to worship. Jesus said we're called to worship in spirit and in truth that according to the truth of His Word, we would worship Almighty God from the deepest parts of who we are. 
So Christ followers worship God, and that's a Sunday morning thing for sure, but it's also an every moment thing. The second thing, Christ followers connect with each other. Christ followers connect with each other. The first church, you can read about it in Acts chapter 2, particularly in verses 42 through 47. They gathered together. They were together. And I want to tell you something. As we have emerged from COVID, how many of you realize we have emerged from COVID? We didn't know if we'd ever emerge from COVID. We've emerged. Now we're concerned about like, you know, stomach viruses and the flu and things like that again. But as we have emerged, something dangerous has happened. My football coaches in college used to say it takes 27 repetitions of anything to set a pattern. And so that meant we had to run every play 27 or more times to set that pattern in muscle memory. Well, we got through COVID, but some new muscle memory has formed. And some of us, well, we we got used to checking out some really great preachers on our phone singing along with some really great singers on our phone, but we've not re-engaged with the community of Christ. I'm going to tell you something. I grew up hearing this strange word. We still use it around here. Church family. Church isn't a place I go or an organization that I'm a part of. This is my faith family. And they celebrate me like bringing a hat on my birthday when I'm a chaperone at children's camp. They celebrate me and they rejoice with me, but they also weep with me and they walk alongside me because for every one of us, life is going to hit sometime. And I really want to encourage you, be a part of the church family. And I want to encourage you, find a group if you're in the room in the, in the bulletin today, there is an insert that tells you about some new koinonia groups. Koinonia is a koine Greek word that means fellowship. But find a group that you can be a part of, whether that's a Sunday school class or a Bible study class or a koinonia group here in the context of First Baptist Church and connect. 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 Don't let church be the place where you go to remain anonymous. God didn't design it that way. Go walk alongside your brothers and sisters in Christ and let them walk alongside you. And that flows right into the next thing, the third point. Christ followers serve God and others. Christ followers serve God and others. Jesus said this, even the Son of Man came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And if we're going to be like Jesus, we're called to serve. We're called to serve God. We're called to serve one another. And we're called to serve our community at large. Now, that's an expectation, and that's a value here. We haven't listed that. It's not written on a wall or anything. But one of the values of First Baptist Church that I've observed over these last seven and a half years that I've been here, is that we are a people committed to making our community better. And that means we use what God has given us, gifts and talents and abilities and resources, to serve the church so we serve each other. And as we do that, we're serving God. But to also serve our community and to make our community better. Because as we do that, we're also serving God. You know, many of you volunteer in the schools. And I want to encourage you Keep doing that because not only are you blessing the students and the teachers and the administrators and the staff by using what God has given you to help them and to teach them and to come alongside and encourage them, but you are also being the presence of the body of Christ in those moments. How many of you have ever been in a moment that seemed really mundane like a bake sale or a fundraiser or a football game or something? And all of a sudden, God showed up. Some student or some other parent or some teacher started confiding in you, sharing their heart with you, sharing their struggle with you. I'm telling you, it happens. And I believe that God has called us to go to where the people are. If you like, we're supposed to be like the little mermaid. We want to be where the people are. 
You know, I'll tell every minister on our staff, you don't minister well by sitting behind a desk all day. Go to where the people are. That's where Jesus went. Notice Jesus didn't sit at the synagogue office and say, you all come by, I'm here waiting for you. What'd he do? He was where the people were because people were his mission. And people were the whole point of his coming, to glorify God by connecting with the people. So we serve. We serve God. And we serve God by serving each other at church and by serving our community at large in all sorts of ways all week long. Keep doing that. That's a calling. That's a holy thing. Serve God. And then the fourth point. Christ followers invest their lives in making disciples. Paul wrote to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.2, saying, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. What was Paul doing? Well, Paul had received from Jesus, and now Paul had poured that into Timothy, and he was saying, hey, Timothy, don't let it stop with you. You take what I've poured into you, and you pour it into the next generation, and have them pour it into the next generation, because that's how this works. And that's why you're a part of this experience today, because somebody poured it into you. When we talk about investing, people say, all right, the preacher's talking about money now. Nope. Money comes in worship. If you can't give to God, that's not an investment issue, that's a worship issue. We're talking about investing our lives. We do that by prayer partnerships in the most basic form, where we pray for each other day in and day out. We connect with each other on a weekly basis. We'll launch new prayer partners in September. But investing is about so much more than our money. Investing is about pouring our lives into others. And that's what Christ followers do. Glenn Stanton wrote a book entitled The Myth of the Dying Church, How Christianity is Actually Thriving in America and the World. And he gives a point and a stat that I want us to hear as we think about the next generation going back to school. He says, 85% of teens raised by parents who took their faith very seriously and lived in a home with consistent faith practices became young adults who not only had a serious faith, but had the highest levels of religious belief and practice among their peers. The secret to reaching the next generations and to transforming the society is the way that we live out our faith in every moment. We have decided to follow Jesus, and deciding to follow Jesus is not a one-time decision. It's an every decision decision. So we're going to sing, and as we sing, I pray we mean it like never before. Would you pray with me? Lord, we love you.